such an amazing talk. Uh, we're going to go to our last speaker now, which is Dr. Anthony. Um, so Dr. Anthony, I think he is here as well. Perfect. So Dr. Anthony, he's a foundation year two doctor in general surgery. So he's in Swansea, he, which is also here in Wales. He graduated from Cardiff University as well in 2020. And he was the president of CHIPS in 2019, 2020. So that's great to have him he here as well. He's going to talk to you about professional development and finances. So really, really important in every medical student career. You really have to think outside of the box and think about your professional development, other things that you should be doing just besides being just a medical student, which is already hard enough you know not <laughs> we still have to think about all of that professional aspects of the career of a doctor but we have anthony here to guide you in each step of the way anthony welcome thank you right Thanks. okay Amazing. Yeah. can you guys see my screen the first question we can see a blue screen yeah that's good and you can see me and you can hear me well yep yeah, that's fine. Okay, so first of all, because there are thirteen people on the on the um, chat, I I just wanted to make this you know a bit more chilled out, relaxed. Um, so basically, what I want to do is get everyone to you know say at what stage they're in. This is including the co-host um, and the chips team as well, because I because then I'll be able to focus on certain points that would be helpful for everyone. Um, I can see some names that I've seen before, but if you can just pop in the chat, like at what stage are you in? Say, oh, you're a third year medical student or, oh, I haven't even done medicine. I started my first year. That would be amazing. So, uh, Iman said, just started my first year. Hello. Welcome to medicine. Congratulations on making it. Um, Amanda is a year three medical student. All right in the middle. And Chris is doing A-levels. Um, uh, Alicia is doing, th is in third year. Um, Shabita is a, is a year two and Annabelle is a year two as well and the rest of these are probably very senior as doctors and also it's very nice to hear Matt. Um, Matt and I went to Cardiff together in the same year and yeah it's very nice to see um, some familiar faces and names as well and Trevor is obviously a lovely fourth year. Okay so you're all medical students and um, some people are thinking about doing medicine or starting in a healthcare a related um, career. So this talk would be highly relevant to all of you and I hope um, this would help you guys. So without further ado, I'm going to start off by saying a statement that university is expensive. Um, why is it expensive? If you look at the tuition fees of <clears throat> MBBS medical degrees in the UK, um, you can see, and this is for international students, you can see that this number is crazy high. Um, on average, it's basically just under 30 grand or say in Cardiff, it goes to 30 grand basically. So it's a lot of money. Not including your accommodation um, and not including your groceries if you go and buy your uh, weekly shopping. And then for some of you who've got um, hobbies and you know shopping hobbies, designer clothes and all that, that adds to the thing as well. If you like to eat out, um, eat nice food, um, go out, have parties, drinks and all that, that adds into the uh, bill as well. And for those of you who like to watch sports, um, football fans, basketball fans, all of these will add up to the bill. Um, or for those of you who like to play sports, then obviously sports doesn't come in free as well. Um, for some others, they like to travel, uh, go to the beaches, um, see some nice areas, or go up to the mountains, um, uh, or even go and visit different cities. And obviously, if you are um, quite adventurous and you'd like to see other stuff um, outside of medical activities, at some point, you're probably gonna need a car. Probably not this is a first car um, for a medical student, but a car of some sort. And eventually, for those of you who um, are staying and working in the UK, probably you might want to buy a house. So hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. That is a lot of money, yeah, and I agree, I know, which is why today we're going to talk about how to financially survive medical school and invest in yourself. Um, my name is Anthony, I'm one of the BF2s in Swansea, and this talk is basically um, a bit of my reflection when I started in 2015. This is a cheeky selfie I took um, on a massive mirror 
when I started. And then over the over my five years journey in medical school and <clears throat> my F1 year into last year. So this is me last year during our own graduation ceremony because there was no co because there was COVID. Um, so the key question is what to invest your time and money on whilst you're in med school. So over time, I thought of these four key pillars of um, what makes a good, well-rounded doctor. And what I found out as well, because I'm applying for um, core surgical training this year, this actually maps a lot with what specialties are wanting um, in your application when you are deciding on what to do um, after your F1 and F2s. So I split it up into academic performance, um, motivation and commitment to your target, whatever your target is. That could be being a GP, that could be um, going into surgery, that could be um, doing medicine, that could be taking a year out, traveling the world and everything. Obviously, everyone has their own commitments and everything. Um, also, then we're talking about extracurricular activities and passion beyond medicine, because more and more specialties are recognizing that in order to prevent stress and burnout, um, you as doctors, you probably want to do something else other than medicine rather than just study, 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 go on placement um, and go to conferences. And at the end of the day, um, obviously having a social life and having a good, a good support system um, is a massive benefit as well. So we're going to talk about academic performance very, very briefly because this talk is not about academics at all. Um, but for those of you who are in year one to year five, these are a few um, cues onto what you could be doing. Um, <clears throat> I'm by no means affiliated to any of these. I'm not affiliated by uh, to any of them, but these are the stuff that I found helpful when I did my um, medical school. So for those of you who are in year one, um, anatomy revision sessions with surgical societies are very helpful. Um, CHIPS and other societies are usually doing some revision sessions. Um, there's a poster there. Um, in year two, depends on how interested you are, um, you might start to look at looking at textbooks like Kumar and Clark's, um, Geeky Medics and OSCE Stop for um, ISKI revisions, and some of you might decide to start um, looking at past medicine. So this is a, a question bank that's online that will help you pass your progress test, and you don't have to jump into the final straight away, you can go on slow and then build it up. But one common theme here is that you can rely on quite a lot of free resources um, and none of these books you can you definitely have to buy um, because mo nowadays you can find them online anyway um, but yeah rely on events that are happening all around um, almost weekly so go on Facebook uh, go on the Cardiff U University Students Union's website and find out uh, what's going on in terms of revision sessions and everything Moving on, um, talking about motivation and commitment to specialties. Um, I was interested in surgery ever since I uh, went to med school. So there are a lot of opportunities out there for those of you who are interested in, um, in specialties. If you are interested in GP, the Royal College of GPs and a lot of um, Royal College of Medicine are also doing um, poster presentations, um, conferences, opportunity to develop quite a lot of things. So therefore, these are um, a good opportunity to do that. Um, I'm not saying that you have to do these, but a lot of these things do actually help um, your professional development as medical students. Because when you um, graduate and you move into the postgraduate world, being a doctor and everything, um, one of the requirements is commitment to, um, to lifelong learning, which means that you eventually will have to do this. So why not start? Um, during your free time to learn a little bit on, on things like research. Um, if you are a bit more practical, maybe attend a, a skills course and everything. And there is quite a lot of opportunity out there. And most of these are free as well for medical students. Medical students get the best benefit of doing everything for free. So all of these conferences are free. All of these surgical skills um, lab, this is one in YMAT, which is basically just outside um, the car park in UHW in Heath Hospital. Um, this is all happening for free. So um, you can get yourself out there, start some Googling and find out conferences and prizes and opportunities um, whilst you are in medical school. 
Moving on, extracurricular activities are um, a good way to de-stress once you've once you've done all this, once you revise for your exams. Um, it's always a good time to be surrounded with friends to do something that you're passionate about, uh, passionate about, and not you know having to think about placement, not having to think about medicine at all. Um, so the picture on the top left is um, um, a yearly uh, theme called Stage Up. So th these are part of Chips as well. Um, so where medical students basically go around in the wards and sing music. Uh, normally it, ha it happened during Christmas to patients on the ward. And these help them to cheer um, everyone up, bring their mood, and hopefully reduce their length of stay in the hospital. Um, and down here on the left as well was when I was in first year. And this is an event called Know Your Blood Pressure. So this is um, a initially student-led activity that was developed by um, one of the current core trainees called Charles Pope, he's here, um, where medical students go into shopping centers and they record people's blood pressure and then advise them to either go to the GP um, or find out what they can do about it. Um, as well. And you can also join some sports activities if you're a keen sportsman, uh, sportsman either basketball, football, um, rugby, um, all the way to, you know, maybe non -so, not so sporty activities like chess. Um, all of these are available in, in the university and all you have to do is look and sign up pretty much. Um, social events are obviously um, all around the area. Um, if you know, all the way through if the year. Um, if you're thinking about oh, having some time out to just party or um, have some food together with some friends or attend some events, um, all of these are widely available. And I would recommend uh, getting out there to meet some new people who could possibly, um, you could rely on in the future. So they could be your bosses in the future. You could be working with them or you could have some opportunities that develop out of these as well. Um, for those of you who uh, likes a bit more uh, non-medical non related stuff, like you can also join other stuff out there which are purely non-medical um, and, for, for, and doing things in the interest of the international culture. So for example, a few years ago when I was in CHIPS, we organized a cultural night. This is a night that basically um, performances, uh, games, and food stalls um, in the event of uh, raising international awareness and celebrating cultural diversities in the hospital. So there are so many things that you can do um, whilst you're in med school. And if you could think of something, don't be ashamed. Just bring yourself forward and um, start that. Because none of these um, exist before. Uh, and it only takes someone to, to go ahead speak to your friends and start these initiatives. Okay, now let's talk about money. Um, Matt has already talked about how complicated it is um, to, to become a consultant, obviously from when you started uh, in med school, some of you might have thought, oh my goodness, I've got another 30, 40 years before I can literally, you know, put my feet up and relax. Well, unfortunately that is how it is um, for doctors. And you probably know as well, that this is the career pathway, uh, that you have five years or six years in medical school, and then you do two years of F1, and then afterwards you choose your um, specialty training. And this graph in here basically shows the average salary by profession. And if, you, if you're expecting junior doctors to land up, up here, you probably have to think again. Um, junior doctors, in fact, they earn very little. They earn only about 23,000, this, this is the average starting salary. And if we break that down as well, um, this is the scales for junior doctors. So this is the minimum pay and basically of, of an F1. Oops, don't do that yet. And then as, as you progress, obviously your salary goes up and these are the numbers that you would be expecting to get for um, your initial unbanded salary. Now, for those of you who are thinking about um, where to work, this is for the like fourth years, fifth years. Um, in Wales, there's this thing called banding. So banding means that um, if you work extra, well, they, they make you work extra as part of the um, timetable. 
you basically have um, more, more of your basic salary. So in Wales, certain jobs like surgical jobs and some medical jobs, they have 50% banding. So what that means is that if your um, initial salary is £24,000 as an F1, um, having a 50% banding means that your salary becomes basically 1.5 times 24,000, which is about 36,000. So obviously this brings it up, um, you know, when you're comparing it with the average graduate starting salary. Um, and if you stay in Wales, obviously dependent on how much commitment you do and everything and on calls and all that, um, this applies all the way through um, till the specialty registrar area. Obviously this is different when you do um, GP because when you start GP, you normally work um, nine to five unless you're doing some extra commitments and everything. So for those of you who doesn't know anything about taxes and pensions, um, this is basically a basic scheme on how um, the government would basically, you know, get, get some taxes. So there's this thing called personal allowance, which is a 12,500 tax free money from whatever you're earning. So if you think about it, you would have thought that, oh, as an F1, I earn 24K. And if they are giving me free tax-free allowances of half of it, that means I don't pay half, I don't pay tax for half of my stuff. Not really. In a, in, in a way, um, they have done this 12,500. This is for a year. Um, in a way that is divided throughout the 12 months when you're working. So what you ended up with um, is for as an F1, you'll have your first um, salary uh, almost tax-free or having very little tax because what happens is uh, when you started in August, the, the tax-free allowances that counts every month, which is translates to about £1,000, has stacked up from a April to August and that was basically giving you your first pay paycheck um, almost tax-free basically. Um, most doctors will go into the basic rate here. If you earn about 12,500 to 50,000, you'll be taxed at 20%. So whatever number you get um, will be taxed um, at 20%. And as soon as you get towards the level of, you know, specialty registrars and heading towards consultancy, you, you will get this tax rate at 40%, uh, which is actually is, is a big amount. And anything over that, uh, over 150,000, you'll be taxed at 45%. You know, for those of you um, budding plastic surgeons, private orthopedic surgeons and all that, and that's probably the numbers that you're looking at. Now, looking at some real life figures, this is my last paycheck. Um, don't worry, I've removed any important information in there, so you can't uh, call uh, payroll and ask about my details. But basically, this is my paycheck. Um, when was this? Um, at the start of F2. So... Uh, what you have to check, for those of you who are, who are med students, as soon as you get your first paycheck, you need to look at this bit that says tax code. So C1257 is the usual tax code for um, everyone working in 2021, 2022. Um, if they have a W1 or H1 or X1 um, after that, that means that you're basically on emergency tax and you, that you'll be taking home much less money. Um, this is the amount of hours that you work and this is the rate that you're working at. If you look at it, it's pretty sad. Um, doctors are paid basically £12 um, an hour, but obviously because of banding, which is the band 1A in here, you ended up um, you know, getting paid more at the end of the day. So for those of you wondering, whoops, for those of you wondering how much money you take home, as an F1, you take home about £2,300. Um, as an F2, you take home about 2,700 or 800 pounds and CT1, about 3,000 pounds. And that basically goes up gradually, very, you know, very slightly um, until you earn about four to 5,000 as a registrar and about um, 8,000 a month uh, when you start to become a consultant. And this is a, this is a point for consultant surgeons. Uh, I don't know about medical consultants, but I think they're pretty similar. So... Um, what are a few tips for financial sustainability? How can you, how can you save money um, in med school? Thinking about all of the stuff that you have to buy, thinking about um, if, you, if you want to head towards a special career pathway, thinking about courses, thinking about um, conferences, thinking about um, 
booking accommodation if you want to um, attend these conferences or attend these courses. There's quite a lot of things that you have to think about. So starting to save money during medical school is a very feasible idea. So first of all, I have this 10% rule. Um, it's not mine. Um, I found it somewhere online. But basically, whenever you're thinking of buying something big, like, for example, um, I have a phone. And if I think, OK, the new iPhone 13 Pro Max is out, for example, and I want to buy that, I need to think about the 10% rule. So if you want to buy something, imagine that you need to have, uh, imagine that, that the price of that item should be 10% of the amount of money that you can freely spend. So if you want to buy a £1,000 phone, you need to have at least £10,000 that you can move around. If you think, if you think of it that way, um, you'll, you'll be able to save a lot of money and you know, not buy um, stuff that you don't really need, pretty much. That, that, that applies the same with cars, with uh, consoles, you know, if you want to buy a PS5 um, or if you want to um, organize a trip somewhere. Um, that should really help if you think about it in the 10% rule. Next um, is splitting your salary or your money um, every month. So for those of you who um, are medical students, uh, some of you may not earn salaries if you don't work part time. So if you have a budget every month of what you're going to spend on and make sure you save a little bit of these money. Um, you know, you could use it for your holiday. You could um, save it for your electives when you're going in your fifth years. And there's a lot of things that you could do with proper budgeting. Um, having at least two savings account or two debit cards, I find um, is very useful because for some of you um, who are international students, some, some parents might think that, oh yeah, let's just send a lump sum to the children. Let's give like, say 10 grand for the year. You pay for your accommodation. This is your money for the whole year. And if you have one savings account, one debit card, it's very easy to think that I am rich. I've got enough money. I've got 10 grand in the bank. And you just start, you know, with, nowadays with Apple watches, with um, contactless debit cards, you pretty much buy everything um, and just, you know, by tapping your card. And before you know it, you would basically um, waste your money and then end up in, in overdraft. So have at least two savings accounts. Monzos and Starlings are the best um, for students because they don't do a lot of checks and you can move your money around. Just put about enough money, just enough money um, to survive on one month. And then you'll start thinking about, hold on now, do I really need to buy this new Ultra Boost that costs 160 pounds or do I just um, save it for next year or when it goes on sale? Okay, I haven't got enough money, let's do that. Um, the next thing I would say is don't be picky on food. Um, this is is actually something that my dad would have said so many times um it's basically if you if you try and save some money and not eat proper food you would suffer later on like you you might feel tired you might feel sleepy um your your academic performances or if you are a sports person might not be as good if you eat properly there is this um medical student saying that says oh yeah i'll buy this and then I'll live off um, uh, pot noodles for the next two weeks. No, that, that, don't follow that. Um, make sure you spend adequate time to think about, you know, what kind of food would, uh, you know, would help you in the long run, um, vegetables and all that. I'm not, I'm not going to say anything about food. It all depends on your personal preferences. Now, this is more towards the um, more senior medical students. Any legit courses below 80 quid is a steal. So if anyone's offering basic surgical skills um, or things like uh, preparing for a career in so-and-so or a conference anywhere um, that's professional that says you will earn some CPD points and which is below 80 pounds, go grab it. It will count towards your um, um, specialty training application and it will make you stand out from other medical students um, if you are thinking about um, going into a career in specific specialties. Um, trying a part-time job is also something that I would recommend to everyone. You might have think that you might have thought that. Hold on now, I've got enough money. Um, I'm grateful for that, but why would I need to, you know, do some part-time job? It's, it's difficult enough to be a medical student. Um, it's not so much about that. It's, it's so much. It's more about um, having an awareness of what um, having a job is like 
having adequate experiences and and by doing this it will help you in the long run to understand the value of money and um and working with people and having an experience um having worked outside the nhs before um i've seen a couple of friends who um weren't who international friends who weren't able to get a job in the uk this is not this is not medical um simply because they haven't they haven't worked anywhere before in the employment section is pretty much empty so having a part-time job whether it's working in a restaurant whether it's teaching a level students whether it's running um whether it's helping um sports activities by uh, you know serving food selling tickets um being a bartender there's 1001 ways to do a part-time job um whilst you're a medical student um reclaim your work-based expenses i don't know if anyone's done this before basically i just found out recently that if you move somewhere for placement or for a job, you can reclaim up to a certain amount of money. And if you if you drive as well to placement, for example, um, and if you drive other people, um, if you're in a different city, you can reclaim your petrol. Or um, as doctors, if you say, if you have to move from Cardiff to North Wales, um, you can reclaim up to say like, um, was it 500 pounds of your, of your relocation expenses? And even if you have to move house between deaneries, you can claim up to eight thousand um, pounds for, you know, which will help you if you have to sell your house and buy another house um, for legal stamp duties and all that. So whenever med school says, "Oh, this is a form to reclaim your expenses," have a look at that and see if you can um, get some money back. And this also applies the same with for those of you who started to uh, work. You can also reclaim your tax when going into expensive courses, when becoming a member of Royal College of something, um, because effectively these are things that you get and you do for your own work per se. And finally, this is something that everyone or you know some medical st uh, students are getting quite good at, which is developing passive income. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I'm by no means a no expert on, on business, but you can start thinking about how can I develop these income? Maybe is it investing on cryptocurrency? Is it starting an online business? Is it being a YouTuber um, or being an influencer? All of these are possible. And there are some examples online of people who have developed these passive income whilst they were at, med at medical school. And finally, to finish off, um, I think I'm overrunning a bit. Um, the, these are some tips for professional development. So first of all, you can join a society or create your own society if you feel strongly about something. This would um, develop your leadership, your managerial, your organizational skills, and um, enable you to work with others better in the future. Um, joining a sports or music activities outside medicine of any kind would really help you um, to de-stress, would also help you to have friends outside of medicine who don't only talk about placements, don't only talk about your cases on progress tests, on how much, um, questions I got wrong on past medicine, this would really help you to think outside of medicine when you really need to. Um, having a good support network is um, something that a lot of people um, would just simply say, oh yeah, that'll just be my family. I call them once a week and all that. But this is, these are more about physical support networks. So people who are always with you, it could be a close group of friends. It could be um, if you um, have a religion or believe in some faith, it could be some people around you. So for me, it would be some people around in my church um, who I visited and who I um, attended events with uh, quite regularly. It could be um, having, it could be being in a relationship, um, which would help uh, quite a lot of people. But having a good support network is crucial and essential at medical school, because at the end of the day, it is a long um, journey and it's very difficult as well. Um, have a reflecting time every week. Um, for those of you who are social extroverts and basically go out on a daily basis, um, this would be this could be a good tip. So having a reflection time, just having your own time, sitting down at home, maybe lying in bed, listening to music, that could actually help you reflect on what's actually important in life and what you want to um, move on and do in the future. Uh, nothing can replace your clinical placements. I have seen people fail their exams, 
failed their OSCEs, um, having to reset a few stuff just because they haven't attended to clinical placements. These are actually useful. And you, at the end of the day, this is what you're paying for in your clinical years. And um, you better make use of it. And applying for prizes um, given by the medical school or by the royal colleges, this tip would overlap with the um, finances bit because prizes, not only it sets you apart, not only it gives you points in your applications, um, sometimes or, or most times they give you money as well. Uh, medical school has a lot of bursaries uh, for your electives, for doing projects. Um, and these royal colleges are basically um, giving out monies in poster competitions, in placement opportunities, and a lot of other stuff that if you just spend the time to Google, you might, um, you might find something that would be very suited to your situation. And hey, it works at the end of the day as a motivation for you to, um, to perform well in your professional development. Um, supporting your friends along the way is also um, a good thing. Um, at the end of the day, you never know who, who your friends would become. You never know in 10 years time, they might be a consultant who you're referring to. They might be um, your business partner in the, in, in the future. So supporting your friends, making sure that everyone is having a good time, making sure everyone doesn't fail an exam is a good example of um, how you can develop not only yourself, but also the people around you. Because in the, at the end of the day, these might and will possibly very likely be um, your professional colleagues in the future. And at the end of the day, repeating what I said um, just now, it's the connection that counts. I've seen countless of people change careers or um, got accepted into a prestigious hospital or um, have a career changing um, opportunities based on their connections. So at the end of the day, why do you go into conferences, courses, supporting your friends, um, you know, be keen and, and attend events and all that, go to your placement, speak to the consultants is uh, occasionally with these connections, th these are what um, will help you in the long run and determine your career pathway as well. Okay, we've come at the end. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm here. And hopefully this talk has helped you um, to financially survive and uh, develop yourself during med school. Wow, amazing. Uh, Anthony, honestly, such a great talk. I think it was super engaging. And what you mentioned there, I think it, the highlight pretty much was about the planning and the reflection because sometimes you have so much information nowadays, you know, about what you should be doing or what you could do and tips. But if you don't sit down and decide for yourself what is important to you and then how you're actually going to put that in practice is great. You know, all of the theory and understanding how to do things. But what 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 are you going to do? You know, what are, or what are the next steps? So what Anthony mentioned about reflecting about uh, taking some time to reflect, you know, from one once in a while, just sit down and think, OK, what should I be doing? Uh, what do I want to achieve? And then going step by step, you have your whole journey throughout medical school. So you don't need to go crazy and do everything at once. But uh, it's just having a building that mindset. I think it's important just for professional development and the financial development as well, building that, that mindset of how you should increase your your active sort of sources of income, you know, but also make it passive so that you don't have to worry about it because as medical professionals, we'll all have super busy lives, you know, we're not going to become business people or economists or anything like that, but make money work for you and have this sort of like mindset to plan your financial life. And also the mindset to plan your yourself professionally because medic it goes beyond medical school. Unfortunately, medical school is super hard, but it goes beyond that. And what Anthony mentioned about networking and meeting other people, it really broadens your your minds and opens doors for you that you didn't think about before. So make sure you you connect with people through chips and through other societies as well throughout medical school. Thank you, Anthony, for such such a great talk. If anyone wants to 